Hello and welcome to video 3 for week 8. After the mammoth video 2 where we proved Kepler's first law, we're going to try and continue and prove Kepler's second and third law. I've left the two lemma formulas up on the left since I'm going to use them again. The setup is exactly the same as before, I'm not going to go over the details of it again. The arrangement, the use of polar coordinates, the curve gamma, all the definitions from the previous video, we're just going to continue on and try and prove the next two laws. So the second law says the area swept out by a line between the large mass and the satellite is constant in time. So what's going on with sweeping out area? Well, here's the movement of gamma. I'm thinking about gamma moving counterclockwise around this orbit. Over a little period of time, it sweeps out a little area. So we can see this shaded area on the page here. And as it sort of moves further, it sweeps out more and more area. The idea is that the rate at which this area gets added to the orbit is fixed in time. And that means when it's way out here, the object has to be moving slower because as it goes through here, it's creating quite a lot of area, whereas the object in here, as it goes through a region in here, there's not nearly as much area, so the object has to be moving faster. And this fits observation. Satellites do move faster when they're closer in and slower when they're further out. And that precise relationship can be encoded by this sweeping out equal area over equal time. Now I want to talk a little about a little infinitesimal piece of area because I want to set up an integral for the area that is swept out. So if I go from gamma of t to gamma of t plus dt a little bit time later, this area here is sort of like a tiny triangle. And the length of the tiny triangle is r, and the width of the tiny triangle is this little db, the length across the edge of this ellipse. But this length db, I can write it as r d theta. So if I look, look, look for a little piece of the angle here, then multiply by that r, then I get a little piece of the arc length. So that means that the area of this triangle, um, 1 half r db is going to be the same as 1 half r r d theta, or 1 half r squared d theta. So a little infinitesimal piece of area can be represented by 1 half r squared d theta in terms of the angle sweeping around. And I wanted the little infinitesimal piece of area in terms of the angle because that's what I want to relate. I want to re relate how quickly area is being swept out in terms of theta, and I can think here of theta depending on time. So the entire angle swept out between t equals 0 and some value t is going to be the integral of these infinitesimals. So I can write it as the integral. I'll use a different temporary variable w. And in order to relate this to d theta, I can write this as d theta over dw dw. But then I can differentiate this, which is sort of funny. I set it up as integral, but that's fine. I can differentiate it, and the fundamental theorem tells me that the change in area over time is going to be 1 half r squared d theta over dt. And I would like for this to be constant. That's the whole thing. Kepler's second law says that the rate of change of area in terms of time should be a constant. It's not zero. There is area getting swept out. It's just a constant rate. So if I can prove that this is a constant, I'll have established Kepler's second law. How am I going to do that? Well, let me return to my curve. I want to write it in Cartesian coordinates now. So if I, if I have r of t and theta of t, if to return to Cartesian coordinates, the x coordinate is r cos theta, the y coordinate is r sine theta. And I've already proved in the previous law that the z coordinate is 0. That gives me gamma. So the direction of gamma u, which is gamma divided by gamma prime, and gamma prime is exactly r. We set up gamma so that it pointed out the distance from the origin. In polar coordinates, that's exactly r. So dividing by r gets rid of this, gets rid of this. I just get cos theta t, sine theta t, and 0. Then if I take the derivative of this unit vector, derivative of cosine is negative sine, derivative of sine is cosine, this is 0. And using the chain rule, since I don't know how theta depends on t, I have to multiply this all by the derivative of the inside, d theta over dt. Finally, if I take the cross product of these two things, uh, let me erase some of this to try and make this cross product make more sense. So this is going to be this times this in the cross product, that's going to be 0. It's going to be this times this in the cross product, that's, that's going to be 0. 
and the third term of the cross product is going to be cos squared plus sine squared is going to be equal to 1. So I get a very, very nice cross product here, and then I multiply by this scalar d theta over dt, which is multiplied by the second vector. Scalars work well with cross products. And then I can use the lemma that says that h is length of gamma squared u times u prime. So that's going to be length of gamma squared u times u prime was just equal to this, so I put that here. So I get this whole scalar times the direction 0, 0, 1. All right, so that's what I just said. Um, if I look at the length of this thing, well, I get the length of this is 1. Um, so I just get length of gamma squared d theta dt. Uh, gamma, length of gamma is, again, r. That was the whole setup, is that if we have uh, gamma being the position here with theta here, gamma is exactly the distance out from the origin. So the length of gamma is the radius term in polar coordinates. So replace this gamma with r so that the length of h is going to be r of t squared d theta dt. But this was exactly up to a factor of 1 half what I have two slides ago for the derivative of the area. So I can replace this piece with length of h. And I get that the change in the area over time is 1 half times the length of the specter, special vector h. And we know from the first lemma that h is a constant. So its length is a constant. So this thing is a constant. And that proves Kepler's second law. And this hopefully starts to give us a bit of a picture for why this vector h was so important. I mean, it's obviously so important. We used it all through this derivation and all these cross products gave us some interesting information. But why did we have to sort of con consider this third direction anyway? Well, somehow the length of this cross product is going to give us a measure of how much area is being swept out. Um, which up to the size of the ellipse gives us a sense of how quickly our object is moving around its orbit. All right, let's go to the third law and try and prove this third law before we get away from this chaos and madness, which is all of these lengthy proof calculations of cross products and derivatives and parametric curves and polar coordinates. So this says the period of the revolution, how long it takes to do a full revolution, is proportional, its square is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of the ellipse. And this is, this is again another thing that Kepler saw from observation. How long does it take to go around a whole loop of the ellipse? Well, if I have the distance out here as the semi-major axis, it turns out that I get a weird cubed squared relationship. It does make sense the larger the ellipse, the larger it takes to go around, but it's not a straight linear relationship. Kepler observes something different. Um, so I get this relationship, and this relationship only depends on the mass of the central object. That means that a satellite uh, with a certain fixed starting velocity is going to have the same period regardless of whether it's a tiny rock or whole planet orbiting a sun. They're both going to have the same period of revolution. Let's try and prove this. I'm going to start with the um, integral of the last line of the previous proof. So the last line of the previous proof said the derivative of a was 1 half h. If I integrate both sides of this and take a starting value of 0 by choosing my uh, position well, then I say that the area in terms of time is going to be length of h over 2 times t. And the area in terms of a whole period, so capital T is a whole period, so this is the area for one whole revolution will then be the length of h times t, capital T over 2. But a whole revolution is going to go around the whole ellipse, ellipse. So this area for a whole period is going to give me the whole area of the ellipse. And the area of an ellipse is pi times the product of the minor axis and the major axis a. If I rearrange this for t, I get t is 2 pi a b over length of h. I square it, I get this. So now I have my t squared. I want to arrange this side so that it's something times a cubed. How am I going to do that? Well, this is what I'm starting with. In the section on conics, I didn't do this in the video, but in the notes, once I have my special form r equals ed uh, over uh, 1 plus e cos theta, uh, 
whatever that expression was. I think that's slightly wrong, but I don't have it in front of me when recording this video. But whatever that expression was, I'll not leave it on the screen in case I'm writing the wrong thing. Whatever that expression was, I can rearrange that expression to actually calculate the major and minor axes of the ellipse from E and D, from the eccentricity and the distance between the focus and the directrix. And that's a way of going back and forth between the descriptions of conics. So see the notes in the end of the notes in section eight, uh, section one of week eight for the derivations if you're concerned about where these a squared and b squared expressions come from. They're all about the new description of conics in terms of eccentricity and then how to relate that back to the old description of conics in terms of semi-major and semi-minor axes. If I take a divided by b squared and do a bunch of algebra with this, which I'm going to skip, turns out that this is equal to 1 over ed. So it's just sort of cancelling off a bunch of terms, taking some square roots, making sure all the things work out. Um, so if I take reciprocals, this gives me ed equals b squared over a. But the definitions of ED in terms of the previous video, when I defined E and when I defined D in the proof of Kepler's first law, if I go back and insert what I had for those definitions, um, the product was equal to length of H squared over G times M. So this, I'm getting, I'm skipping a little bit of algebra, but this comes from the proof in the previous video, the proof of the first law. If I rearrange this, I get length of h squared is equal to ed times gm. And now I'm going to replace a bunch of things. First, I'm going to replace length of h squared with this. So I can put that here. And then I'm going to replace ed with b squared over a, put that here, and cancel things off. And what I get out of it is exactly 4 pi squared over gm times a cubed. And this is precisely the relationship that I wanted. t squared is some constant times a cubed. And that constant depends on capital M. So it depends on the mass of the central object, but it doesn't depend on any of the other geometry. It doesn't depend on the little mass. It doesn't depend on the initial conditions. Four and pi and, and the gravitational constant g are completely independent of the rest of the situation. And that's Kepler's third law. And after all that work, hopefully you are at least a little bit convinced that we can start with Newton gravity and in fact derive exactly all of the things that Kepler observed a full century before Newton even wrote down his gravitational equations.